welcome back to my flat. Uh, it is considerably tidier than it was two weeks ago when we last uh, met. And uh, welcome to another episode of Stop In With Sean. Um, so yeah, it's two weeks since we last had a chat and an awful lot has happened in that last two weeks. But I can't, can't really talk about any of that because I'm still shocked and quite tired um, from staying up late last night to watch the shocking statement from the President of the United States. Uh, there was, obviously there was the, the demonstrative lack of compassion in the way that he read from the auto cue, these messages of unity that he clearly was making a point that he didn't care about. But then there was also the, the astonishing, dictatorial, fascistic, virtual declaration of war on his own people and his own state. Now, I'm, I'm not an expert on the American uh, constitution, but if you are an American and you've grown up with that constitution drummed into you, the, the very sinister way that he invoked the Second Amendment, the, the right to bear arms in the way that he talked, um, the way he directly threatened states with bringing in the military is just astounding. I haven't actually recovered from watching it last night. Now, the calls here from the UK are to stop immediately the sale of arms, the export of tear gas, rubber bullets and riot shields to the United States. These calls are coming from Amnesty and the campaign against the arms trade. I'm fully backing those up and you should seek them out and back those too. And then here today, like overnight as well, we have the astonishing decision by the UK government not to release their report into the disproportionate impact of the coronavirus crisis and uh, the medical um, deaths and, and illnesses on our BME people here. So I'm joining calls for this decision to be reversed. It's honestly ridiculous. I spend my days in my jobs looking at the inequalities in housing, in welfare, in policing, in cuts to, to services and job opportunities and violence. And in, in all of this, there is a clear intersection of, of class and race. And we absolutely cannot shy away from looking at that. It stands out so strongly. So this is exactly the time for honest discussion of the structural racism and our disproportionate um, lack of opportunity and discrimination that occurs towards our black citizens. It is not the time to be suppressing a report into the impact on them, especially not when this month we've got the three year anniversary of the Grenfell disaster coming as well, which is another example of structural racism within our society. It is just wrong. The government needs to release that report. So, having said that, I have a packed 20 minute show for you today and we are today looking at the arts industry, what's been going on during lockdown, how they've been dealing with uh, social distancing and the, and the closure of many of their venues. And we've got four artists joining us for a group discussion and to share some of their work during lockdown. We've got um, Sam Murray coming up. He's a musician and the former chair of the Young Greens. Uh, we've got Zach Polanski, who's an actor and uh, a London Assembly candidate, uh, one of my colleagues at the moment, working quite hard with him. And Charlotte George, uh, another Green, who's a filmmaker who's worked for the BBC. And Eleanor Margolis, who's a writer who works mainly for the theatre. They've all brought in some work, some clips to share with you, and we're going to have a, a nice discussion all together. So let's get them onto my screen now. Hello. So we have uh, Zach and Charlotte and Eleanor all on my screen now. And uh, Sam can't make it today. He's been called into an urgent staff meeting, his job. Um, so he will be, uh, he's provided for us uh, a video to show what his views are. Now, what I want to talk to people about today is the big question of, of what is the arts doing? How are, how are the arts coping during lockdown? How are people's different industries um, dealing with this? So Sam, who works in, in music, he's a music industry expert and academic, has sent us a video, which I think we can, we can play right about now. Hi folks, uh, my name's Sam Murray. 
I'm the uh, Musicians Union Rep to the Trade Union Congress Young Workers, and the video you are about to see is from my band, Me and My Friends. Uh, we decided to try and create a track that kind of captures everybody's feelings within uh, self-isolation and the current feeling of quarantine. Uh, and this was also really very much a test for us to be able to try and record uh, a track completely online by sending audio files between each other by making our own videos on our phones. Uh, and we decided to do this as a test because we have some um, band members in Leeds, some in Bristol and some in London. Uh, and we decided to make this track also to raise money for a community kitchen in Bristol called Coexist Community Kitchen who have been feeding vulnerable people but also key and NHS workers as well. So we released this as a charity single a few weeks ago so hope you enjoy it. much for sending us uh, that Sam um, and thank you thank you for, for contributing even though you're in a staff meeting right now uh, we will hopefully you'll see the recording of this later um, so now moving on to Zach um, Zach you are uh, an actor you've been doing some interesting stuff during lockdown that you're about to show us I think yeah absolutely so obviously being a being an actor and an artist by our nature we have to be resilient we have to be creative and find new ways of doing things so the whole picture for the whole theatre scene across London and the UK at the moment is pretty grim, both from the commercial and national theatres that have been well documented are struggling for funding. Also, it's really bad for the fringe projects and kind of community work. And um, one thing we did uh, with a uh, company called Exit Productions and the Arts Council is we created a project uh, where we worked on Zoom for two weeks, uh, 20 of us from all over the UK to look at how could we make art that is virtual and we could engage people in different ways. I was involved with a project called Eco Chambers. Uh, the idea was that we wanted to explore environmental and planetary issues, but also for people who might not have access to video or to microphones. So we created a game, essentially, an interactive game on Google Docs, where a group of people together would come up for a new planet, for rules of the planet and the manifesto. So the clip I'm going to share, actually, is backstage. The four of us, the four co-creators, are on the side of the screen watching the audience as we provoke them um, by asking them questions um, about things like, do we want to protect the people or do we want to protect the planet? Of course, the answer is both, uh, but we wanted them to get them there themselves. So this is the clip. I think even if they don't get to three, I, I, we need to thank these people. They're doing an amazing job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that This is quite amazing. <laughs> oh, I want to cry. <laughs> um, That's amazing. It was, so you gave them, how long did you give them? It said time remaining two. Did you give them two minutes to come up with a, a new way of running the world? <laughs> and so a major part of the show was to keep putting people under stress. And we're hoping to bring it back at Battersea Arts Centre. We made a physical version of it about a year ago. And hopefully one day when we're all allowed in the same room together again, uh, we're hoping to run another version of it. That's amazing. I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm, you know, we, I work up, most of my work is over Zoom. Uh, an awful lot of it's over Google Docs, actually. Um, and the idea of having people like bossing you while you're right. actually doing time. <laughs> but yeah, also, I mean, yeah, what, what, what big things to get people to, to talk about. That's, that's honestly brilliant. Nice, nice. Nice and creative. And um, how did that come about? Was that did you, you repurpose a grant you already had to do this project instead? Is that is that right? Yeah, that's exactly what happened. So we were doing the project at Batsy Arts Centre. We'd had some test runs, and then as part of this um, R and D project, 
we were looking at how can we take something that was in the real world and put it live. But actually, Google Docs brought about new things because we found when we did it live, very often the men in the room would dominate, people who knew more about the environment would dominate. And there's something about putting online, actually, that men with the anonym anonymity, uh, the dynamics started to shift a little bit. So we want to work on it more and see how we can push that further to kind of create new ways of people disagreeing, but in respectful ways. That's so interesting. Thank you, Britt. Thank you very much for bringing that, Zach. Thank you. Um, right, now on to Charlotte. Charlotte. Hello. You, you do media. So a lot of people have suddenly, suddenly decided to get into media um, because that's all we've got left. Um, but obviously there must be challenges for your industry as well. Have you been coping with that? Well, in, in some ways the challenges are probably almost the opposite of theatre in that um, probably it won't be too long before theatre makers will be able to make something, but how do you find an audience? Uh, it's the complete opposite for film and TV. There is a ready-made audience all sitting at home, <laughs> desperately <laughs> consuming content on um, BBC, Netflix and Amazon, wherever. Uh, but how do you actually physically make it when uh, to create a TV show? I mean, you know, it requires dozens and dozens of people, sometimes hundreds, depending on, you know, if it was Game of Thrones. Um, you know, you want a crew of 50 people, how to cast safely interact with each other you know can you have plot lines about with um, fight scenes or physical intimacy any of those kinds of things are now going to throw up huge um, practical dilemmas on set so although there's a lot of people consuming television the audience is there the problem is how does how does production start now the government has said it can start but and guidelines were released today about how to do it but of course it's yet to be actually experienced and experimented with. Um, I mean, one thing you can do is uh, the clip that I've brought is a minute from a short film that I made with a friend actually in Melbourne. So I directed it here. I zoomed into her. She filmed, she had to be the actor and the cinematographer and do lighting and everything else at her end. Um, and then I edited it um, here in London. Uh, so this is on a very small scale, uh, a, a way of tackling um, how to create new content. Pete, hi, finally, it's so nice to meet you. Um, oh God, I'm really nervous. I'm new to the whole online dating thing, but um, yeah, I guess it's not like we can go get a drink or anything. Um, can I just say that you look exactly like your profile pic? Sorry, I didn't catch that. I've got a bit of a dodgy connection here. Wow, you have such a beautiful accent. I can only understand bits and pieces, but um, I love your energy. Where are you from? That sounds so exotic. Maybe you could take me there someday. Yeah, there's a very silly <laughs> short film sketch that we made just to lighten the mood. <laughs> very good. And um, I mean, presumably scripts that you already have as written are going to be a, a, an issue now. Is there a lot of rewriting going on? Are people trying to sort of make do with, with like no crowd yeah. scenes? Yeah, well, I mean, I th my prediction is next year there'll be a lot of stuff set in 2019 that comes out where people don't want to have to deal with what what does the new world look like. Um, you know, I mean, my partner's working on a, a new cop show and it's like, well, are people, are they all going to be wearing masks all the time? Uh, you know, are people, like, how are they going to interact going into people's houses? Like, I mean, it's just hard to know what, it's going to look like next year, the end of this year into next year. So, and of course, if you're making something in the next few months, it's to be screened next year. Um, so it, to be honest, it's an ongoing discussion and all the writers I know are struggling with it. Um, also writing stuff that feels relevant. It's such a big thing around this whole world. Um, but of course, I don't think everyone's going to be wanting to watch TV shows about viruses next year. Um, so <laughs> it, again, it's that balance. How do you approach it as an artist and have something to say about it and acknowledge the world has changed, but also not overwhelm people with it? These, yeah. are, I, these are ongoing discussions. I don't think anyone has the answer yet. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so, Eleanor, um, you work in the theatre. Um, that must be um, an enormous challenge. I mean, the, you have the audience question, don't you? Mm-hmm. Uh, how How is the theatre coping? I mean, is there anything that, that can be done? Well, at the moment, they're making extraordinary efforts, both the big houses and experimental and fringe theatres, to put work online and archive streams, um, but also new work like like Zach's. Um, And I work as an audio describer for blind and partially sighted people. And all the audio describers who normally work in live theatre are working really hard to try and make sure that accessibility is still there because suddenly there's this huge audience across the world watching shows from the National Theatre. People who can't usually physically get there, either they're in another country or for other reasons. Um, So there's a massive opportunity to share theatre with new audiences and when things reopen that people will be able to come back into the same room but it's quite important to keep um, accessibility in in terms of um, diverse audiences as well. Um, the, (laughs) The clip I brought is about thinking about the whole ecology of theatre and not just actors um that thinking about designers and construction processes, carpenters, uh, costume makers, there's a a kind of, I think we often think about what's most visible, but it's a huge industry with lots of people working behind. So the clip is about showing how a theatre model connects different people. a way of thinking about space so modeling making something and thinking through those relationships between people between spaces with the the theater well that's brilliant i i I used i I used to do technical stuff for theaters when i was a student (laughs) what what was that set for (laughs) That was for a production of Antigone, designed by Sutra Gilmore in 2011. And what was that, is that a little Olivier theatre? What, what, what's the, the circle? Was it? So it, a- it was designed for the Olivier theatre, um, and yeah, that was just part of the model that we were looking at there. Brilliant. Um, so, what's what's the what's the answer with audiences? What what are we going to do? Is that is that potential for? Um, more remote audiences to to make up for the ones that can't be fitted in? Is that the sort of discussion that's going on at the moment? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, we've seen pictures recently from um, Berlin of people spaced out in theatre taking out extra seats, but also um, Alice Saville Saville from Exeunt wrote a brilliant piece recently about just experimentation in theatre and thinking more about headphones theatre, which people have been experimenting with for years going into landscapes, one-to-one theatre, all kinds of experimentation that gets away from the standard model. Um, There's just space to play with that, I think. Yeah, it's um, it's interesting. Sometimes you want to go to the theatre to sort of sit in your own world and just really get absorbed in the story. And sometimes you want to go to experience it with the other people more. And there's that question, isn't there? Um, Wow. Okay, so thank you for bringing on the stuff what can be done now what what's i mean the industry is in crisis isn't it you're all furloughed there's there's all kinds of pauses um do we need to put more support into the theater what can be done to 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 fix the industry and keep it going through this this rough patch you're all full of so so many ideas of how things can be done better but there must be a cash flow crisis right now i think there's absolutely a cash flow crisis Um, And I think that probably what needs to happen is a very specific arts um, 
funding and support from the government um, for venues, for furloughed staff. But a lot of artists are self-employed and there was an article today in the Guardian saying a lot of BBC contractors have fallen through the gaps between being, they can't be furloughed because they're not full-time workers and they can't receive the self-employed um, support either because uh, they main, their main source of income is the BBC. So at the moment, there are a lot of people in the arts industries falling between the gaps. So there's the people who are going to need extra level of support, um, but plus the venues are going to need it as well because, uh, as um, Eleanor was just saying, it's hard to know how they're going to be able to bring people back. I think the first uh, new types of theatre are probably going to be more outdoors and are going to be in new spaces. Um, and, uh, yeah, so venues are going to need extra support as well. So I've, I got a letter um, yesterday from uh, Paul Valentine, who happens to be one of my colleagues on the Green Party executive, who also um, is the PCS at the Taipei Centre. Um, and he's sent me um, the PCS's calls to action to, to help the South Bank Centre. Um, and it includes, you know, let's not reopen until it's safe for the workers. It includes things like um, supporting the self-employed, you don't qualify, and extending the furlough scheme. Um, but then another one of their asks is a reversal of privatisation in the culture sector. And what you said about contractors and, and, and what's, what Zach said about, you know, working in, in small grants, shouldn't we be really just piling in and supporting the arts sector now? Um, as an essential service in a, in a way that, that the excessive involvement of money and, and profit has just already left them. Anyone? Um, <laughs> I, I think there's a really obvious point to make that we need to value the work of telling stories, particularly at a time when our national story or international story has been so severely disrupted. And actually, as the Green Party, we've been leading a fantastic narrative of building better than before. So creating this new normal and actually art and story is going to be a huge part of that. Uh, one project I've been involved with is something called Theatre of the Oppressed. That was from the 1970s in the favelas working with the most vulnerable communities in Brazil, looking to give people a voice using art to help them create legislation. I've been working, for instance, with the London Renters Union to find out ways people can challenge our landlords to make sure they've got rights. And as we know, there's lots of vulnerable people in London, but a lot of those vulnerable people are artists and I think we need to use the art both for form to help make the new legislation and to be pushing the assembly and the mayor to make sure that we're holding to account that we really need to protect our, our theatres, our film, our, our art, whatever it might be. And obviously, and go on, go on, Nelda. Absolutely, an economic case as well for investment in the arts that um, roughly every pound that's invested in theatre returns three pounds to the exchequer so we don't have to be shy about saying this is um, an industry that's worth investing in, as well as being something that helps us tell our stories and feel empathy and understand other people's experience. And the South Bank Centre is a really lovely example to hear about because so many of the events, I think about 40% are free there. So you can just wander by, you can be on a family outing on to the river and just pop in and hear a bit of music, go to see an exhibition, and that builds knowledge it builds access and then people go on to participate in other ways. Yeah, no, it's, it's surprisingly accessible, the, the art and the, the spaces around the, the South Bank Centre, plus the architecture, which I love as well. Now, I'm not going to let you get away without me bringing up the subject of universal basic income, because that's one of the reasons that, that we like the universal basic income in the Green Party, is that it frees people up to choose creative careers. I mean, I talked before about structural um, oppression and structural racism in, in the lack of opportunities there are for people. And the universal basic income is one of those things that levels up the opportunities for people to, to live creative lives, to tell stories. Um, is, it not, is this not just another, one more reason why we need this in this conversation? I think, ab absolutely. I think um, artists have, long been supportive of the universal basic income for this reason is that it's about va having value beyond you know doing it well I mean as Eleanor as Eleanor said it does the arts does contribute a lot to the economy but also there's a bigger contribution to culture that is sort of harder to qualify financially and universal basic income allows people the the space and the ability to pursue those um 
pursue those careers and tell those stories. And it would allow us to have story. The the concern I have post Corona is that actually inequality within the arts might increase again. There've been lots of things happening in terms of bringing more um, women into film and TV and more BME um, communities into film and TV and theater as well. And I'm concerned that might start to split off again um, and become more unequal, but a universal basic income would be a terrific way to help um, level that out and allow access to people who otherwise whose stories we're not hearing. Yeah. Okay, so my final question, and I'll let Sam go first because he has pre-recorded his answer to my question, <laughs> is so what can the, what does the government need to do now to support the arts and creative industries right now most urgently? That is that is my question. So to contribute to the discussion about what could be done to support the music sector at this particular time, I think we really need to see the government in particular closing the gaps uh, that have allowed people to fall through the net if they haven't qualified for self-employment support or if they haven't qualified for furlough. And a big part of this has been restrictions such as saying that you have to uh, basically have been a freelancer for a certain amount of time before you can qualify for the scheme or it has to make up a certain percentage of your income because many workers in music for example might have a portfolio career where they don't just do a music job they might also have another job on the side that they might not have any support with whether it is you know you might be a graphic designer you could even be a barista and you might not be getting furloughed from that particular job as well so there has been a gap that a lot of people have fallen through that needs to be addressed uh, I think in terms of what can really help in is whether it's reducing business, whether it's getting recording studio, studio. Uh, but also ensuring that there is fundamental support for those key London venues, and particularly in the West End, where we have a lot of musicians playing in pit bands, to really ensure that those theatres are supported to reopen in a really sensible and safe way, but in the meanwhile that those musicians are supported through that. So those are just some ideas of what could be done to improve that situation. So, that broke up a little bit there, but towards the end, he was saying that the mayor has to do more to support the, the venues within London. There is work that the GLA has been doing to um, support the, the, the buildings, the structures, the small theatres, the music venues in particular, um, which has, has been a big loss of those. Darren Johnson, who was assembly member before me, helped expose that, that problem. And, and we've made some progress in London, but obviously the crisis throws it all back up into the air. So uh, Charlotte, you're on my screen. You can go next. <laughs> I don't know why you're on my screen. What should the government do urgently? Um, I think that uh, urg urgently they need to come up actually with a specific arts and creative industries package. It needs to include venues. It needs to include freelancers, um, the people who are falling through the gaps, extending the furlough, um, as Paul said in his letter, um, for venues that might not be able to open um, soon. Uh, uh, it needs to include giving more money to the Arts Council, to BBC, to BFI, uh, the big institutions who can then uh, trickle it down, not that I'm supporting trickle down economics, but who can trickle it down to um, artists and freelancers who at the moment are really struggling. But I think it needs to be a specific package for this sector because we have very um, specific and unusual needs. Thank you. And Eleanor, what would you like to see happen most urgently? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to look at the other part of theatre and not to forget about youth theatres, community theatres, small theatres and supporting artists is a way to do that um, but to think about the whole ecology of theatre that and all the different places where people first make contact with it and picking up Charlotte's earlier point about not losing the gains in diversity and building back better because we still had a lot of exploitation, precarious contracts, big barriers to people getting involved in theatre. And there's a risk that we go back, but there's an opportunity to improve things. It's a really good point. I mean, obviously, two weeks ago, I had on Hannah talking about the, uh, the threats to, to youth services and, and youth theatres are, are, are you know, the best types of youth clubs in my opinion. <laughs> I used to be a youth theatre. But yeah, no, these, these whole, all these ways in. Uh, further down the chain from where you're making profits, a uh, really important as well. So finally, Zach, Zach, what can be, what can we do? 
Um, I agree with every word that's just been said, actually. I think also to look at hyperlocal, or at least London as a, as a region, it's about making sure that we're investing and in nurturing uh, our artists and making sure that they feel safe through things like a universal basic income. You just mentioned youth services there. I think it's a really important point to highlight because actually it's at that young age that people really grow up to, to love drama and to love music as well as sport. And I'm worried about the legacy of people being stuck indoors and not being able to interact with people. So as soon as we get out, you know, I'd call on the mayor to make sure that we can get those youth services running up again. In the absence of that, I couldn't come on your show and say, oh, we could elect a green mayor like Sean Berry. And I think she'd be able to sort everything out. <laughs> Yes, we have to wait a whole year till till we get the green mayor that we deserve. But um, yeah, we, the, you know, there's so much that that we that is within the mayor's power. There's so much that the DLA could do to support all of this. But yeah, thank you for making that point. <laughs> thank you, thank you everyone for coming on. It's been uh, complicated show today, <laughs> technically, but we think we've uh, we've had a really nice discussion, and it's great to see all the work that you're doing. Uh, we've put the links to the full versions of all your videos into the chat, and we'll put that out when we put it out on Facebook as well, so people can watch all of your excellent work. Um, we'll be back next week and um, I hope uh, we'll be talking about schools and um, issues around uh, the um, testing and tracing issue, uh, things that are being piloted in the Isle of Wight and also my, my own borough of Camden, which is looking at some of the community test and trace stuff. So let's hope we get uh, the guests that we, that we are asking for next week to talk about that. And uh, we'll see you all next time. Meanwhile, take care of yourselves, take care of others. Let's be honest about the problems we have in society and Black Lives Matter. Thank you.